I wanted to say uh, thank you to the to the group and um, also the many people who have been involved with helping pushing forward dietary research with our program here. I'm based at Seattle Children's Hospital and I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist. And um, interestingly, I'm uh, seeing some familiar names on the Zoom meeting right now. And I'll have to say, uh, some of you are uh, wonderful friends of mine, and uh, some of you all may be patients of mine or other GI doctors. And um, a, a large thank you to you all for, for teaching us, for being partners with us as we do dietary research. Today, I'm gonna be talking about uh, about dietary therapy in general and how it has informed a study that we have very recently completed here at Seattle Children's Hospital. And uh, Jeffrey and I have been in dialogue and he's been asking, when are you ready to present? So I think we're ready to present as we have our preliminary data um, reasonably tidied up. We have not yet published the data. So um, I, I will be uh, conscientious and conservative about what I share and how I interpret the data. Okay, guys? And uh, Jeffrey, I'll say if you have good questions coming up along the way, I completely don't mind pausing for a moment um, because sometimes if there's a pertinent question, it's good to discuss it in the context of how things are, in the context of the presentation. Okay. So I'm going to start my presentation now, guys. Um, I have no disclosures related to this presentation. And the overview of what I'm hoping to cover today is number one. Uh, discussing why considering nutrition in the setting of inflammatory bowel disease. Second, I want to review a variety of different dietary approaches to inflammatory bowel disease. First, we'll talk about exclusive enteral nutrition, also known as EEN. And next, I'll briefly review restriction diets. And number two is really going to lead into why we developed our pilot trial. And then number three is going to be here uh, discussing findings from our pilot trial, which we termed the reverse engineered EEN study, or REEEN. To begin with, um, when we think about the causes of inflammatory bowel disease, it's important to respect what has led to the eventual development of the disease process. First is the genetic predisposition. We all have certain predispositions based upon our genes, and some people's immune systems are more inclined to be um, activated due to a variety of factors. We know that the environment is important for the eventual development of inflammatory bowel disease. Things like the, the foods that you have consumed, the exposure to antibiotics and infections can all trigger an abnormal response by your immune system. And when, with this perfect storm occurring, you have a, an ongoing cycle of inflammation with the immune system, and this results as inflammatory bowel disease. Inflammation itself is not a bad thing, but if it is unchecked and perpetuated, that can result in problems like inflammatory bowel disease. When we think about targets for therapy in inflammatory bowel disease, I like this triangle as we think about what different areas we can use from a therapeutic perspective. I'll say the most common thing we think about is the immune system. Uh, and this is what the majority of GI physicians will think about and likely chat with you about. And I think this is an important component of therapy for inflammatory bowel disease. We use immunosuppressive medications. Next, we think about the, the gut microbiome. And we think about, can we use probiotics, prebiotics in the forms of foods? Are antibiotics at all part of the picture here? And there have been studies on fecal transplantation as well. Diet is a bit of a, a black box in some sense, but in other senses, it's really well described. And I've put arrows because diet impacts your gut microbiome and diet also impacts your immune system. And many of you may have used or continue to utilize dietary therapies. And in my opinion, this is a really wise approach. And sometimes you can use a dietary approach as a standalone. And another time you can use it in combination with uh, other gut microbiome or immune system focused therapies. So you may be in a unique situation where you have to speak with your doctor and say and, and discuss why, why is diet important or why is it not important. Uh, many doctors will respect that diet is important, but they won't know exactly how to harness dietary therapies. So there's quite a bit of publishing going on, many studies going on, including my group here. So just to go through a few reasons why I think diet is important. Number one, patients are interested in this and there's a clear message that this seems to be impacting disease course. Second, we know that immunosuppressive medications are a mainstay of IBD therapy, but they are not effective for everyone. 
This study here on the right is a bar chart, and this is from a 2010 publication for the SONIC trial, and it's looking at medication called infliximab. Uh, the, the trade name prior was Remicade. And it compared therapy with a med called azathioprine alone in yellow. There was about 40, 35, 30% of people were in steroid-free remission. If you used Remicade or infliximab alone, 44% of folks at 26 weeks were in remission. And then if you looked at uh, the combination of infliximab plus azathioprine, people said, wow, this is great. 56.8% of people were in remission. In my opinion, this is a success yet in that there is benefit. This seems to be a good combination therapy. But in the red here, I've highlighted, we still have a large number, over 40% of people who have not received or were not able to achieve remission here. So in my opinion, medications are an important mainstay of therapy, but we can do better. And adding on things like dietary therapy, they play a very important point. We know that with immunosuppressive medications, there may be a slightly increased risk of certain forms of cancer, as well as infections. So there's a trade-off here. Using therapies may put you at increased risk, and importantly, we have to monitor closely. And then finally, why focus on diet? We know that dietary therapy can be effective. So we have to harness this uh, ability to use dietary therapy. And of course, uh, of course, close partnership with your medical team is, is absolutely imperative for successful dietary therapy. I like this, I, I, I drew this myself, so it's a little bit childish, but I think this is a good reminder, both for patients as well as for the medical team. If your house is this beautiful little gray house right here, and you are nearby a wildfire, um, you could use just a fireman with a hose. Um, you could just do that and hope that things are under control. But if you are worried about your house and this fire is out of control, you wanna use the whole crew here. So you'll want the fire truck here. You may even want to call in the helicopter to drop water on top of this. In my opinion, this is an analogy for inflammatory bowel disease that may be difficult to treat. Perhaps you'll use one medication. Perhaps you'll use two medications. And perhaps we should be thinking about also layering on dietary therapy, pulling out all the stops to comprehensively control the inflammation for inflammatory bowel disease. When I talk about dietary therapy, I want to be really forthright about some of the reasons uh, the medical community is a bit hesitant to use dietary therapy. There are some limitations to the data, and physicians and advanced practice practitioners are, for a good reason, very data-driven. They want good studies demonstrating efficacy and safety, and dietary trials are a bit challenging. Some reason dietary trials are challenging to do and to publish are, number one, lifestyle change is not easy. So implementing something like the specific carbohydrate diet, like you guys know, it's a big deal and many people cannot pull it off. Second, there's broad variability in food and studying food is challenging because people could be on the same specific carbohydrate diet, but eating a vastly different um, quality of food and quantity of certain foods. Third, there's an interaction here. If you eat this steak here on the left with some rice and some beautiful broccoli, that steak is gonna interact differently with your body than if you have steak and these beautifully golden uh, French fries, okay? So food interacts, so one food product in itself is not the issue. It's this interaction and sort of the net sum of foods consumed that, that play an impact that impact your body's uh, metabolism, microbiome, and the immune system. Fourth, there's a substitution effect. If you pull something out of somebody's diet, there's gonna be something else that needs to substitute into their diet. So dietary studies are tricky. You pull something out and there's gonna be an unintentional increase in many things. Finally, there's the adherence piece with dietary trials. We have run multiple dietary trials, including the one I'm gonna discuss, and adherence is phenomenally difficult. So if you don't have perfect adherence, sometimes you may come to the conclusion that a particular therapy works really well or doesn't work well. And you may, and it's important that you are also able to describe, okay, to what degree was the person on the intended diet? And you'll hear for a lot of, a lot of physicians will talk about randomized controlled trials as the gold standard for producing data that is saying, does a therapy work or does it not work? Randomized controlled trials for food are really difficult, oftentimes not feasible. Um, number one, um, people know what they're eating. So it's hard to randomize people to one thing or versus another. Second, a long-term dietary intervention is very difficult. So sometimes shorter controlled trials are beneficial to understand. So because 
many dietary trials do not have randomized control data, um, physicians and advanced practice practitioners are sometimes hesitant to embrace using this. So I'm going to briefly go over some nutritional approaches to IBD, and I apologize. You guys are probably an extremely well-educated group about, about dietary therapy, so I'll try to touch on some unique points and share my interpretation of some of the data. I'll talk about exclusive enteral nutrition. I'll talk briefly about certain exclusion diets. I'll focus on the, the data for SCD, um, CD treat, and the Crohn's disease exclusion diet. I'm not going to go over everything in great depth. So exclusive enteral nutrition. I'm not sure if anybody watching this webinar right now has had a family member on this therapy. Um, it is challenging, but it is the best studied dietary therapy for inflammatory bowel disease. And it's specifically for Crohn's disease. This is not for ulcerative colitis. It's also known as the defined formula diet. And with this approach, an individual will drink formula to provide nearly 100% of their nutritional needs and not eat standard food. Okay, so essentially only formula, no food. The formula can be, be taken by mouth or for some people, the decision is made to place a nasogastric tube to deliver the formula, and this circumvents the taste fatigue that can potentially occur. Interestingly, this does not require a specific formula. So folks have used a variety of different commercial formulas all around the world, um, and here at Seattle Children's Hospital, we've used a variety of different formulas and seen similar efficacy. The approach with this formula-based therapy is to use it for about four to 12 weeks, and it is to induce or to drive the, the inflammation into remission, okay? So for Crohn's disease, it's usually a short-term therapy, get things into remission, and then transition to um, other maintenance approaches, be it medicinal or with dietary approach, for example, the specific carbohydrate diet. EEN, the formula approach, has been demonstrated to be effective at inducing remission in about 70 to 80% of people so it is, it's a pretty effective therapy. This is a, a really well-known study out of Italy. Um, Osvaldo Borelli did this study. It was a randomized trial comparing uh, EEN versus corticosteroids. They had 37 children enrolled in this study, and it was a 10-week trial. At the end of 10 weeks, they found clinical remission in about 80% of young people on EEN and about 70% of folks on steroids, so pretty good for both. When they did follow-up colonoscopies at the end of 10 weeks, this is where the difference showed up. The EEN group had 75% with mucosal healing of the intestines, whereas the steroid group only had about 30% achieving mucosal healing over 10 weeks. So this is a study showing that EEN is superior at inducing mucosal healing. So, some of you all may be adult IBD patients or have adult family members. And what about exclusive enteral nutrition in adults? It is definitely highlighted in pediatrics and studies have suggested that EEN maybe is less effective in adults. And when you look at the data and carefully look at the studies, it appears that the reason for lesser efficacy in adults is that adults are a little less compliant with this dietary approach. If you're a parent, you can, um, you can better ensure compliance in your young person, in your, in your little guy, your child or adolescent. In addition, we know that adults in general will have more complicated disease, including longer disease duration. But if you look at studies in compliant adults, for example, who have a nasogastric tube delivering the formula, who are newly diagnosed with Crohn's disease, we see similar efficacy to the pediatric data, okay? So adults with good compliance on the formula-based approach without a long duration or complicated disease process can have similar efficacy with EEN. So when we think about this, it's important for us to think through what's the mechanism of action for EEN inducing remission in such a high percentage of people with active Crohn's disease? Um, these are some hypotheses here. So hypothesis one is, is it the mechanical properties of foods like specific food residues that are a problem or is it the case that just being on a liquid form is somehow um, healing to the GI tract? Second, is it the case that with EEN, you have the same proteins being, um, being going through the GI tract? And is this antigenic monotony somehow beneficial to the immune system? 
Third, with EEN, are you just repleting essential nutrients that otherwise are not there? Fourth, is it the composition or, or shifting of the function of the gut microbiota with EEN that could be the, the reason things are healing? And fifth, we know that foods and EEN alter the bile acids in your body and which will in turn affect the gut microbiota. And then six here, and I, I'm keen to study number six here because we think that when you're on EEN, you may be reducing the exposure to certain problematic compounds, okay? So for example, harmful products and foods that we eat regularly may be minimized on uh, EEN. And I'm gonna come back to this point because if some of you are thinking, I've looked at the, the, the ingredient list of certain formulas for EEN and they don't appear the, the, the most healthy. I'm gonna come back to that point. So lessons learned from EEN. Um, dietary therapy can be effective. The strongest data for diet and IBD comes from the EEN literature. It is well accepted across the world. Second, substantial dietary change may be needed to cause an effective intervention to treat IBD. Three, uh, the formula type, not important for EEN. Fourth, um, EEN, you've got to pull out foods, okay? So avoidance of foods is important. And fifth, EEN is not, not an easy to maintain therapy. I'm going to shift over to exclusion diets right now. And many of you are experts with the specific carbohydrate diet. And I will, um, I'll talk briefly about SCD. And I want to talk about two of the newer trials for SCD. Um, second, I want to talk about the Crohn's disease exclusion diet. And finally, I'll touch on CD treat. So specific carbohydrate diet, as many of you guys know, there's a significant restriction here. Um, and there's some wonderful literature um, and a book by Elaine Gottschall that really has um, opened up um, this as a, as a wonderful opportunity for folks who have inflammatory bowel disease um, to, to use a dietary intervention. So there's large interest as well as following in the IBD community. And if you look at the medical literature, um, there are numerous case series showing a benefit of the specific carbohydrate diet. And there are two recent pr prospective trials. Um, and it's interesting. Uh, my, my good friend and collaborator, Dr. David Suskind helped to lead a pediatric trial. And my former mentor at the University of, Pen uh, University of Pennsylvania, uh, Dr. Jim Lewis led the other trial. So we'll go and we'll talk about those. Um, this is a, a publication Dr. Suskind and I did um, like 2016 or so, and this was looking at survey data. An online survey, 417 respondents, and you can see here um, on the y-axis up and down is the proportion of respondents um, answering that they had these particular symptoms below. And then on the x-axis going across horizontally, we see the time on the SCD. And we see clearly here that patients are telling us that their symptoms improve over time on the SCD. Um, from nearly, again, 50 to 80% of people having these symptoms early on at time zero and over 12 months, an uh, improvement, okay? So these are symptoms, which is different from um, objective inflammation via endoscopy, colonoscopy, for example. Interestingly, in this study, only 17% of participants um, had collaboration and guidance from their healthcare team. A trial done um, in Atlanta as well as Seattle, um, a specific carbohydrate trial um, with 12 patients, and it looked at objective markers of information, so inflammation. So we looked at C-reactive protein, a blood work marker of inflammation, and we saw that over the course of 12 weeks, there was a nice decline in CRP here in both the Seattle and Atlanta cohorts. We looked at calprotectin, which is a intestinal marker of inflammation you can check in the stool. We see here the Seattle cohort had a nice decline in their calprotectin. The Atlanta cohort did not have a, a statistically significant change here. The Dine CD study was uh, run out of the University of Pennsylvania by Dr. Jim Lewis, my mentor, and uh, it was a comparison of the specific carbohydrate diet as well as the Mediterranean diet. So this was a randomized trial, and there were six weeks of food delivery to your home of either SCD or Mediterranean diet. There were 194 people enrolled in this study. Their average disease duration was 10 years, okay? 30% uh, of them had prior IBD surgery, and over half of them were on a biological drug. And a biological drug means it's an antibody-based drug, okay? And we looked at the outcomes here, and here again, the comparison was SCD versus Mediterranean diet in a, in a population that in general had long duration of disease and were already on medications. 
when we looked at uh, participants achieving a symptomatic remission, we see in blue Mediterranean diet and in orange SCD, fairly similar, 43% and 46% uh, here. So similar amount achieving remission of symptoms. When you look at a change in fecal calprotectin, so a fecal calprotectin response was a significant decline in calprotectin. We see here the Mediterranean diet group had about 31% and the specific carbohydrate diet um, showed about 35%. The conclusion from this study was that um, diet is important, but it looked like SCD and Mediterranean diet were similar. And I'll say these are adults. I think compliance may have been an issue here. Um, so I think it's an interesting finding here. Um, so it's important for us to say, this is a very well done randomized controlled trial. We see that SCD and Mediterranean diet have an impact. The produce study led by my colleague, Dr. David Suskind um, took a slightly different approach. It took a ch children who had inflammatory bowel disease and it compared the strict version of the SCD with a modified version of the specific car carbohydrate diet. And the approach here was you took a patient with active disease and you put them on eight weeks of SCD and then you flipped them over to eight weeks of modified SCD. Or alternatively, you could have had a patient start on the modified SCD and then flip to the strict version of the SCD. So the modified SCD is defined here as including rice, oats, potato, maple syrup, and cocoa. And these were in, in sort of defined uh, uh, quantities, so not unlimited. There were 54 patients enrolled who had active inflammatory bowel disease, so studying both Crohn's as well as UC, all across the United States at 19 sites. So from this study, 21, 21 individuals completed the trial. And interestingly, SCD and modified SCD showed similar results. So this is a graph here. It's a little bit confusing to read, but you look at the, the plus sign. That's where each individual listed below started with their fecal calprotectin. And then you see changes over time, uh, the open boxes being SCD um, and then modified SCD. And then again, if the patients made it to uh, beyond just the first 16 weeks of the trial, they were flipped back to SCD and then went again back to SCD and modified SCD. So we see clearly that there is an improvement in fecal calprotectin, but this study showed that SCD and modified SCD had similar results. I'll say my takeaway from both uh, Dr. Lewis's um, Dine CD trial and Dr. Suskin's produce trial is that diet's really important. SCD works. I think a question that comes up is, so how strict do you have to be on the SCD? And is there some personalization that can work? So um, in my opinion, these are great big trials that are done. Um, they answer some questions, but they also um, lead us down the path of asking some additional questions. The Crohn's disease exclusion diet has been gaining traction. Um, this was a, a diet developed by Dr. Ari Levine in Israel, and they have studied it. This is an interesting approach where they use a combination of, of partial enteral nutrition as well as a restriction diet. Partial enteral nutrition, also known as PEN, is consuming about 50% of your daily calories from a formula, okay? So different than EEN, which is nearly 100% of your calories from formula, okay? With this dietary approach, PEN plus the Crohn's disease exclusion diet, there are certain foods that you avoid, and there are certain foods that are mandatory. And the mandatory five foods I've, I've shown here, bananas, apples, chicken breast, um, potatoes, and egg. So the, the phases with the CDED, so there's this uh, initial phase described as a six weeks duration with a 50% formula, five mandatory foods. And then thereafter, there is some liberalization of the amount of formula that you, that you have to consume. And there's an expansion in the food list. The first study here showed, um, this is a um, not a prospective study, but a retrospective study. At the end of six weeks, there was a clinical response in 78% of people, remission in 70%. And um, if you look here, it looks like the CRP came down pretty nicely. And then this is a disease activity index looking at symptoms. The, the group did a secondary study, and this was a randomized trial over 12 weeks. And they compared these two groups. They looked at EEN versus 50% um, of calories from the CDED 
and 50% of calories from formula. The second two weeks, there was a liberalization of food eaten and decrease in formula. Um, and in the second group, that you were allowed to eat a significant amount of free diet and only have a small amount of formula. So these are the results from this randomized trial comparing EEN, 100% formula, to 50% formula plus the Crohn's disease exclusion diet. We see here, these are, um, this is looking at fecal calprotectin at week zero, week six, and then week 12. So we see here for the CDED plus BEN group that there appeared to be a decline in the fecal calprotectin. Um, and I'll note here, um, it's 732 at the end of week 12. For the EEN group, we see that there was initially a very brisk decline in the fecal calprotectin, uh, more than half right here. Um, and then with liberalization of intake of regular food, there was a rise. My graphic here is important to point out that at the end of 12 weeks on the PEN CDED group, um, fecal calprotectin was still significantly elevated. I, my personal uh, way of interpreting fecal calprotectin is less than 100 is in a, in a, is in a good range. Um, so 732 significant elevation here. So in my opinion, again, diet makes an impact here, but the goal is to get to complete remission. The CD treat diet is an interesting concept, and the idea with this diet was to emulate EEN with regular food. Okay, so they hypothesized that they could create a regular food diet based upon the composition of modulin formula. This is a Nestle formulation that's available in Europe as well as the US now. That they felt that they could achieve similar efficacy as EEN using this approach of using foods that were similar composition to this formula. This diet, they avoided gluten, lactose, and they matched the nutrient content of the formula with the foods that people are eating, and they delivered food via a catering company. They looked at how this impacted 28 healthy adults, and they looked at five children with Crohn's disease. And these were the results from their Crohn's disease patients. Again, very small study, only five patients. Here we see at baseline that calprotectin mean was around 2,400. By four weeks, it had come down to about 1,000. By week eight, it was still hanging around 1,000. So we see net N impact, yes, a positive impact in uh, being able to cause calprotectin to go down, but we see that it did not drive it into the complete normal range. So looking at these restriction diets, there's some important lessons to be learned. Um, first, patients want to utilize diet EEN works well, but it's not something you can maintain. Restriction diets are much more sustainable. They are very hard to maintain, but they are easier to sustain because you can eat food. Second lesson learned, EEN works well, uh, but chemical formula, commercial formulas actually have many chemical comp components. So when you look at these restriction diets, they avoid things like maltodextrin, soy lettuce, and other emulsifiers, etc. But EEN formulas generally will contain these chemicals. So a question myself and my research team posed was, could we potentially use a home blenderized EEN smoothie made from whole foods? And could that be used to treat Crohn's disease? And might that teach us some important concepts, concepts about how to implement and utilize diet as therapy? So the genesis, the end product of this was the genesis of the reverse engineered exclusive enteral nutrition trial. Our hypothesis for this trial was that nutritional therapy in the form of a whole food-based smoothie can be used to induce remission of active Crohn's disease. We had two aims from this study. First was to develop a whole food-based smoothie comparable in macronutrient and micronutrient to formulas used for EEN. Second, we wanted to evaluate the ability of this whole food-based smoothie to induce remission of symptoms as well as active, remission, active inflammation in Crohn's disease. So you guys probably have a, a fun setup in each of your individual kitchens. We had a, a, we had a smoothie lab where we brought in multiple Vitamix blenders. We had dietitians, um, chemical engineers, as well as a couple lowly physicians um, doing a, a smoothie lab where we attempted to concoct a formulation of a smoothie that was meeting nutritional needs, uh, palatable, and also stable for people. So this is an example of a spreadsheet, one of our, uh, our our dietitians helped us to create. So we looked at different food categories, protein, fat, carbohydrates, and other, and we mixed and matched 
to try to come up with a smoothie formulation that was um, meeting nutritional needs as well as tasty and didn't separate in a weird fashion. Um, we eventually came to the, our intervention here. Um, we decided we were going to give people Vitamix blenders. We decided we were going to ship them food via Amazon Prime um, if they were within the Prime sort of area of delivery um, and give them all the things that they would need to, to make the smoothie on their own in their home environment. So we did a smoothie lab and I'll, I'll tell you here right now, I'm not sharing the full details of our smoothie uh, recipe here. And the reason for it is this. Um, we are going to present and give the details of our smoothie recipe in our publication, but we would prefer that medical practitioners are fully aware of what patients are consuming if they're going to be consuming our, their smoothie, the smoothie at home. And our goal is for this to be democratic and for anybody who wants to use this smoothie to be able to use it. So I'll say our recipe number one, these are the core ingredients here, Greek yogurt, almond butter, ripe bananas, strawberries that were frozen, and hard-boiled egg whites. And I'll say this is not 100% SCD compliant because this was store-bought uh, Greek yogurt, but we did attempt to find yogurt that was low as low as possible and lactose as possible. The second recipe that we tried, we looked at a chicken thigh that was baked, butternut squash, onion roasted vegetable stock, spinach, lentils, avocado, blended. And it, it ended up that when we did these recipes, um, the sweet formulation won out. So that was what we used in our trial. The savory recipe we thought was delicious, but when we had a few select youth consume it, they told us they didn't like it. So the intervention here for this study was this smoothie recipe with a total of nine ingredients, uh, eight ingredients, including water, and then um, a daily multivitamin that was SCD compliant. The design of our study was a prospective open label trial, and it was very much designed only to be a pilot trial to understand, can we develop this smoothie? Is it palatable? And is it going to be beneficial for people? Okay. So we did 10 pediatric patients with active Crohn's disease, all newly diagnosed, over four weeks on this therapy. And folks had the option to continue to eight weeks if they so desired. We also did six healthy adults who consumed only this smoothie for a week. And for these folks, um, we monitored symptoms, weight, as well as their microbiome with stool collection. To be included in this trial, you had to be in the pediatric age range of 8 to 21, a, a new diagnosis of Crohn's, and have active Crohn's disease. You were excluded from this tri trial if you had a history of surgery, a perianal Crohn's disease, if you had already been on a different dietary therapy, if you had already been on medications or antibiotics, or if you had an allergy to any of the components of the smoothie. Also, we did not do this. You were not included in this trial if you had been admitted to the hospital. Our thought was you were in an immediate higher risk category if you were hospitalized. So we wanted to do this initial trial in an, in an outpatient population. So the, the baseline characteristics of our patients here, this is again, unpublished data. Um, we are in the process of, of completing the microbiome analysis before we hopefully get this published by winter time. 10 patients, um, mean age of 14.5, uh, the, the disease duration was less than 14 days on mean. Uh, four males, six females, no surgery, and 30% uh, had upper tract disease. Uh, the, all of them had a small bowel or ileum disease, and 60% had colonic disease. The clinical disease activity was elevated for patients, and their mean calprotectin was uh, 1,149, but there was a large standard deviation. These were the adults. So we had six adults and the mean age was 38. Um, these were all healthy volunteers. And uh, this is their information here. Uh, no, we had one individual with an underlying medical condition. Others uh, were completely healthy. Looking at the data from this study, so changes from baseline to week number four, um, the PCDAI, which is a pediatric Crohn's disease activity index, um, this showed a significant decline over the course of four weeks. So in on average, on aggregate, there was an improvement in disease activity. Also, over four weeks, on average, people had a decline in fecal calprotectin, average of 826 points decline. Um, the weight and BMI of, of our population did not change significantly. And uh, we did a checking for quality of life, and we did not see a statistically significant increase, but there was a net increase in this number. 
When we looked at our outcomes of interest, we looked at clinical remission, clinical response. This is looking at symptoms. Um, we see that the majority of people had an, a significant improvement in their symptoms, with 80% going into full remission of their symptoms. When we looked at C-reactive protein, which is a blood work marker of inflammation, 70% of individuals had normalization of this value. I think this is the most telling picture of the results from our study here. When we look at change in calprotectin, we see over a short period of four weeks that there's a significant decline in calprotectin here. So um, at the baseline, folks had an elevation. And in general, uh, the vast majority had a significant decline in calprotectin. And for our future studies, we think that we should do this for longer than four weeks because it may take longer than four weeks for full normalization. We looked at the microbiome both, both prior to starting this therapy and also at the end of the four-week period. And this is an example of the microbiota um, dem demonstrated graphically here. Um, these are each individual patients down below here. We have data from week zero, week one for our healthy adults here. And then we have data from week zero to four and sometimes week eight for our patients. And the takeaways from the microbiota was that the microbiota profiles were very, very different by individual. So there wasn't a sort of common microbiota profile across the board for folks with IBD. Interestingly, when you looked at changes that occurred, the most variation occurred amongst the lesser abundant uh, bacterial taxa. So again, it might be that certain bacteria are more associated with disease as well as remission. And you could make the, the, the postulation that perhaps certain bacterial species are more problematic. When you compare the microbiome results from our reverse engineered smoothie study to the classic EEN data with formula, there were some differences seen. This is called the Shannon index, and it's a marker of a bacterial diversity. We generally tend to think of a broad and diverse microbiome as a healthy and stable microbiome. When you look at the EEN studies with commercial formula, uniformly on EEN, people have a decrease in their bacterial diversity. Okay, so there's a decrease in diversity. With our study, with reverse engineered EEN, there was actually stability of the diversity, so no significant decrease. So my, our, our team's conclusions from this reverse engineered st study was that a whole food smoothie can be effective to treat Crohn's disease. Second, a whole food smoothie leads to greater gut microbial diversity when you compare it to the conventional commercial formula EEN approach. And third, this begs a question and gives some insight. The mechanism of action of EEN, it's probably more than just shifting of the microbiome that's causing, that's inducing healing here. There must be other elements of dietary therapy, not just shifting of the bacteria that are responsible for improvement and healing using a dietary approach. Guys, and with that, um, I want to talk about our next steps. We are currently, we've submitted for a proposal for a multi-center study. We hope to do a broader study with more patients um, and using a variety of different institutions. So we've contacted a East Coast institution as well as a Canadian institution, and they are eager to participate in this study. So we are hoping that once we publish our data, uh, we can get some funding to study this more broadly. Our hope is to do a larger number of patients as well as um, also develop a different flavor of the smoothie to give folks additional um, sort of variety in what they're eating. Our feeling is that it's not that the reverse engineered smoothie is the end product of our research, but if we can better study how these smoothies are effective and how they impact people's symptoms, their microbiome and the metabolites, we hope that we can have greater insight in learning how we can utilize regular whole food-based dietary therapies, like this specific carbohydrate diet, for example, um, to help treat people with Crohn's disease. It's likely the case that each individual has a unique sort of relationship and response to consuming foods. We hope to better understand that with this study where we can control dietary intake uh, with the smoothie. I want to say a thank you to our collaborators, and I'll say, um, first and foremost, thank you to our patients and the participants in this study. Um, they did get a Vitamix blender. They did get uh, foods delivered to them, but this is no small undertaking for you to have to be on a nutritional therapy this rigorous. So a huge thank you to our patients who are wonderful. 
as well as the families. Um, my colleagues and collaborators here, Dr. David Suskind, um, um, he's a, one of the reasons I came to Seattle Children's. He's a, he's a wonderful friend and we push uh, each other to, to study nutrition. Now, Mason Newding was our study coordinator. Uh, Kim Brawley, Ian Broadley, a powerhouse dietitian and chemical engineer couple. Um, our dietitians, Heather Courtney, uh, Jerem Vanamella, who's a food scientist, and our basic science team, uh, Luke Hoffman, uh, Dr. Christopher Pope, and Hillary Hayden. So uh, it's uh, a huge undertaking, and there's about 15 more people whose names I did not put on here. Um, but it was, a, it was a team effort, and we are looking forward to the next steps from what we've learned. And with that, Jeffrey, if, if you'd like, I'd be happy to take some questions or, or comments from the group. Thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Lee. It was uh, outstanding, and you covered you covered everything. I do have a question. One of the things I may have missed was uh, on the uh, uh, pediatric and the adult that participated in the study. Was it uh, did they drink it orally, or was it by NG tube? This one was completely oral. So um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with hydro flask bottles, but they're pretty fancy water bottles that are very expensive, but they, um, they insulate really nicely. We gave everybody uh, multiple hydro flask bottles and everybody consumed it by mouth. One of the questions that came up was, uh, and this actually comes from me. <laughs> so what about TPN and PPN or total parental nutrition or per you know, partial parental nutrition at home or in the hospital. And that's what I used, actually. I was given as one of the guinea pigs uh, back in the early 80s. And, and being on that for, for a few weeks actually put me in remission. But, you know, and it did give me, obviously, proper nutrition without any chemicals or effect on the gut microbiome. What are your thoughts on that? It's a good question, Jeffrey, and I'm so glad it worked well for you. So for the group, uh, what Jeffrey is describing is intravenous or IV given nutrition. So TPN stands for total parenteral nutrition. So all of your nutritional needs are delivered via an IV into your bloodstream. And PPN is a peripheral parenteral nutrition, usually unable to deliver quite as much nutrition as the total parenteral nutrition because it's in a more of a peripheral vein. And studies have suggested that people have improvement in their symptoms on a TPN or PPN. Um, it's probably because if there's some value in resting your gut as well as delivering nutrition to your body. Um, studies have suggested as soon as you return eating food after these, oftentimes you'll have problems if it's the standard diet that you go back to. The studies for EEN interestingly occurred prior or the initial studies uh, occurred even prior to the advent of TPN, PPN. So there was no intravenous nutrition option. So some surgeons would be caring for people who had severe Crohn's disease. They drop a nasogastric tube and they would trickle, literally trickle in small amounts of formula um, because that was the only way to deliver nutrition to people who had significantly narrowed intestines. Um, so that, it was interesting when they found that people who were able to gain weight, their inflammatory markers improved. So um, nutrition, within the hospital with TPN, PPN may have a, a temporary beneficial effect, but it's not thought to be a, a mainstream approach to treating uh, Crohn's disease. The question that came up is, will ulcerative colitis be studied as well in the future? It's a really good question. And so diet absolutely impacts ulcerative colitis. And for example, the SCD data is, is, is good for ulcerative colitis and the CDED, they've created sort of a, an, an analogous diet, uh, specifically studying um, the ulcerative colitis. So the group in Israel is doing that. Our study, I think EN is classically found to be beneficial for Crohn's disease. We'd like to really push forward the, the study of Crohn's disease first, because that's what EEN has been proven to be effective with. Um, pending how it goes, we will absolutely entertain if, if ulcerative colitis deserves um, and should be studied as well. Would you say that the uh, REEEN um, and the CDED or the SUD um, <laughs> or the specific carbohydrate diet uh, could be a good maintenance treatment? Yes, absolutely. So um, specific carbohydrate diet, I, I will use it as maintenance for my patients. So for some, I will induce remission with SCD and then continue it as maintenance. For many others, we will use other therapies to induce remission 
for example, like the EEN approach and then transition to SCD. So I think SCD is a good approach. The CDED plus partial enteral nutrition, uh, I think that's a reasonable approach as well. Um, again, it's a newer therapy and it's still being studied, but I think it is reasonable for uh, maintenance. I will say I've had certain patients who have severe disease that we cannot control with uh, conventional methods. And um, sometimes we will use EEN as a long-term therapy, but that's in an extenuating uh, circumstance. When do you expect the final results to be published for all, including the rest of it? Well, we've got, uh, we are still going back and forth on the, on the manuscript. We're really uh, waiting for the uh, final analysis of the microbiome data. So we're hoping that within a month or two, we'll be able to submit this. And then um, it takes a lot of time for scientific um, publications to go back and forth through the editorial process in peer review, but uh, we hope that within the next uh, five to six months, this is published. Do you have any thoughts about why rice in particular was chosen as a modified item on SCD or the Crohn's disease exclusion diet? They added rice as well. Do you have uh, any theory or philosophy or opinion on that? <laughs> I don't have a great philosophy here. I think some of it's personal experience where people were expanding and doing quite well. So um, I think brown rice, white rice in moderation. Um, my approach is when I start the Crohn's or the specific carbohydrate diet for folks, and some of you guys have experienced this as well. Some people will start on the most strict version and then liberalize. And I think more and more we're thinking about, can you, can you start on a modified version? I don't think there's been a huge, huge movement in the medical community to go straight to modified. My general preference is to establish that a strict version of the SCD works and then to modify. And that's one of the questions that Elaine had back when was to focus on the monosaccharides and maybe in the near future is to consider adding a few disaccharides um, and see how your body handles that. So. Yeah, and I think it's it's very interesting as we think about specific carbohydrate diet, CDED, other dietary approaches, and including the Mediterranean diet, which uh, Jim Lewis's group studied with Dine CD. I think there is there are absolutely good hypotheses for which food items you can include versus you should not include. Um, it's yet to be determined. Yet. So I think it's still not well understood. We've created a lot of fun hypotheses to try to explain this, but at the end of the day, I think there's work to be done. And it would be wonderful, for example, in the future, if we could help understand what each individual might benefit from. So for example, assessing microbiome as well as other sort of uh, genomic sort of signatures and being able to utilize that to help guide which dietary approaches are the most effective or likely to be the most effective per person. And that was one of the questions that came up was, in the Mediterranean uh, SCD comparison, that 50% were taking biologics and whether or not the biologics actually hindered or helped in the situation. In that study, I think the, the biologics and like the 10 year average disease duration just suggests that these people have complicated disease. And to, to be admitted into that study, to get into that study, you had to have active disease. So again, their therapies were not working. So their conventional therapies were not working. So they layered on either SCD or the Mediterranean diet. So that is, that's, it's a little tricky to interpret that study, but it's a good real life example of, okay, significant problematic IBD and what is the result of, um, what results from adding in a dietary approach. And it showed that it looks like dietary approaches clearly make a difference here. Thank you so much. And, and the follow-up question that the person had was, they're on a biologic, they're following the specific carbohydrate diet, they have a normal calprotactin range, their blood work is coming good, they feel great. They always question whether or not it's the biologic or the specific carbohydrate diet, and what do I do? Do I discontinue the biologic and hope for the best? Or do I just continue to do both until I build up enough antibodies, the biologic is no longer working? 
what a thoughtful question asked. And I'll say first thing, I, I'm not your doctor, so please don't take this as a personal advice. I'm talking in, I'm talking in general, Dr. Leon. So absolutely. So I'm going to make sure that you don't uh, interpret my answer as a um, as a medical directive. So I'll give sort of the big picture of when you make the approach with um, therapy for IBD. So you want to confirm the diagnosis before you start treatment. And then after you start treatment, you want to make sure that you're meeting the goals of your treatment. So you want good control of symptoms, you want good quality of life, and you want to make sure that objective inflammation is well controlled. So for example, you may need to do a repeat upper endoscopy colonoscopy. You may get an imaging study to look at your small bowel. Some people need a capsule endoscopy. And for some people, you'll look at calprotectin blood work. So you want to make sure that you're doing well symptom-wise, quality of life-wise, as well as objective inflammation. And then there's a dialogue with between you and your, your medical team about, okay, I'm doing pretty well right now. Is this a good time to, to attempt to rock the boat or not? And sort of what do we feel like is the most beneficial or not? So hypothetically speaking, um, it would be interesting to see, for example, to if somebody is doing really well on and on a medical approach plus a dietary approach, probably the easier thing to back off of would be to say, okay, I'm going to relax my diet to see what happens with that. Mm -hmm. So the studies have demonstrated if you're on biological therapy with infliximab, I did this study when I was in Philadelphia, it appeared that you could be much more liberal with your diet if you're on a biological therapy. So instead of potentially make, doing something problematic, like stopping a medication, which may be difficult to restart, you can make a dietary intervention to better understand what is the marginal value of, of the diet that I'm doing because it's hard to do. Um, and if it's the case that you do very, very nicely off of your dietary approach, then it may give you some room to be more liberal. If it, again, I think um, the discussion about de-escalating a medication, that's a big picture discussion. And my approach with this is to have a long, hard conversation with my patients to say, if you wanna come off of a medication, let's first make sure you're doing very well. So we'll do everything A to Z to make sure things are are, are in remission. And then we'll talk about, okay, this is how we will monitor if we discontinue a medication. These are the potential consequences if we discontinue a medication, because certain medications, if you discontinue, you will develop antibodies against them and you have difficulty restarting them. So it's a little bit of a back and forth dialogue. And ideally you can try to isolate sort of one versus the other to try to know what is providing the most benefit. In certain situations, um, it's 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 difficult to establish uh, which is the the true uh, heavy heavy hitter in terms of keeping things in remission. Uh, the do you know of the stool test that you used uh, to test the microbiome that we could, as a patient or consumer, purchase or ask our uh, physician to do so? At this point in time, microbiome analysis is very much lab driven. There is a team of many, many people in our lab um, who are interpreting this. So this is by no means at a level of sort of at the at, at patient care, so clinical. This is all very much sort of researchy at this point in time. Hopefully in the future, we would be able to do this on sort of at a more clinical level. So if you, if you, if you go to certain practitioners, they will offer to do a, a microbiome test, but I'll say, um, there's not great data on how to interpret that, sort of the reliability of that data. So um, I would be cautious, and you're likely going to be paying a lot of money out of pocket for that, and I don't think that's worth it at this point in time. Great answer. Thank you so much. Um, someone asked a question. Is there a way to turn, uh, it's, it might be philosophical, I don't know, but is there a way to turn on and turn off the autoimmune disease without medical intervention per se, or maybe with medical intervention? Well, it's a really good question. And we say that Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, they're chronic medical conditions. So you may go into periods of remission where you will have zero evidence of abnormal immunological activity. But if you, uh, if you stop the intervention that's treating or even if you go into spontaneous remission, um, the overwhelming likelihood is that you will have recurrence of inflammation. So at this point, we don't have a cure, which will completely um, clear you of having this medical condition of inflammatory bowel disease, but you can be in remission. And theoretically, if you're in remission, you do not have active inflammation ongoing. I appreciate all of your time, Dr. Lee. Um, yeah. I, I don't want to keep you because I know we're getting to the hour. So 
Yeah, no, I appreciate the opportunity to chat with the group and thank you so much for so many good thoughtful questions. Um, we will work hard to get our publication out and we have uh, we have we've had a discussion we want to publish the recipe so um, people can have access to this um, we want doctors to know what their patients are taking if they're going to be doing this approach um, and we have a lot of work to do ours is only a very small pilot study so we have quite a bit more work to do to demonstrate on a larger scale uh, that this can be effective and can be a tool for inflammatory doses so uh, thank you all so much for the opportunity to chat thank you so much dr lee you have a good evening thank you thank you all